welcome to the Egalitarian Connection, your connection to Christians with biblical equality, archaeology, and the persecuted church. Today our video is titled, The Hermeneutics of Mutuality, Part 1, by Gilbert Bilizekian. This is the first of a series of three videos about the her hermeneutics of mutuality, or study of male and female relationships in the Bible. Gilbert presents the need for a thematic interpretation of the Bible, one theme at a time, on one book at a time, <coughs> Excuse me, rather than attempting to build a case with an arbitrary assemblage of isolated verses. Jesus said God's word is truth, and that all, both Jews and Gentiles, must learn what the truth is because our Heavenly Father is seeking people that want to know the truth. The Bible is for all to understand through Jesus Christ. Look what Paul said in Galatians 3, 27 through 29. For as many of you were baptized into Christ, have put on Christ. There's neither Jew nor Greek. There's neither slave nor free. There's neither male or female. For all one in Christ Jesus. And if you're Christ, then now you're Abraham's seed and heirs according to the promise. Also look in um, John 4. Jesus was speaking to the woman at the well, the Samaritan woman. She asked him a question. The woman said to him, Sir, I perceive that you are a prophet. Our fathers worship on this mountain, and you Jews say that in Jerusalem is the place where one ought to worship. But Jesus said to her, Woman, believe me, the hour is coming when you will neither on this mountain nor in Jerusalem worship the Father. You worship what you don't know. We know what we worship, for salvation is from the Jews. Jesus is from the Jews. But the hour is coming now is when the true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and truth. For the Father is seeking such to worship him. God is spirit, and those who worship him must worship it in spirit and truth. Now let's watch our video on the hermeneutics of mutuality. Dr. Gilbert Belazekian is professor of biblical studies at Wheaton College. Prior to joining the Wheaton family, he served as pastor of the Loudonville Community Church in Albany, New York, earlier as professor at the European Bible Institute in Paris and director of Christian education at the American Church in Paris. Dr. Belazekian received his BA from the University of Paris his Master of Divinity from Gordon Conwell Theological Seminary and Doctor of Theology from Boston University. Born in France of American parents, Dr. Belazikian speaks and writes fluent French and Armenian. He has written numerous articles for French and stateside religious periodicals. He was ordained by the Federation of Baptist Churches of, of France. Dr. Belazikian is the author of The Liberated Gospel and Beyond Sex Roles. Those are two different books which has gone into multiple printings. He is a member of the Theolo Evangelical Theological Society, the Chicago Society of Biblical Research, and the Institute for Biblical Research. He served for a time as interim, interim pastor of the First Baptist Church of Wheaton. He is a charter member and elder of Willow Creek Community Church in South Barrington, Illinois. And let us stand and welcome Dr. Gilbert Belazekian. You can bring the board. You can bring the board. Whenever I have a problem, I'm dealing with an issue for which I don't have the answer, I go to someone and I ask a question. I say, how is that to be done? What is the meaning of this? Can you tell me where I can find this or that? That's what I do. 
and I do it often because I'm not extremely smart, with issues of ultimate concern, with things that involve the mystery of our existence, of who we are, what our place is in this world, what we are doing here, where we are going, is there life after death, and so on. And for those things, I don't have the answer, you don't have the, you don't have the answer, the man out there doesn't have the answer, people in high places don't have the answers. They have answers, but they are, they are their own answers. And I'm not satisfied in anyone else's answer. I'm not satisfied with my own. What is their basis of authority for knowing something for which I know nothing about myself concerning the matters of ultimate concern? This is why whenever I have to find the answer to a matter that has to do with the mysteries of existence, I have no place to go but the Bible. The Bible is my frame of reference, it is my point of reference, it is my authority for matters of faith and practice. Because there is evidence that the Bible is the Word of God. Jesus believed that the Old Testament was the Word of God. He believed that His Word was the Word of God. And He believed that His Word as would be preached and written by His followers, His immediate followers, would be the Word of God. Jesus endorsed the Bible as authoritative Word of God. And if Jesus did that, as a follower of Jesus, the Bible is good enough for me. The Bible is my ultimate authority and I know nothing else but to obey the Bible in matters of faith and practice. Now, this being established, the question has to be raised, but who's going to interpret the Bible for us? Hmm? Because as we go to the Bible, we discover it's a book, book, big book. There are many sub-books in it, 66 of them, the Bible has been written over 2,000 years of time by people of different languages, of different cultures. And how do we understand it? Well, what you do is go to the Bible, find verses on a particular topic, and deal with those verses, and you know what the Bible says. The trouble with that is that for every set of verses that you give me on a particular topic in the Bible, I can come with a counter set of verses that will say the opposite. It's a big book. And on that basis, from the Bible, we can prove anything as being right and its opposite as being right. So what are we going to do? Are we doomed to utter confusion and to uh, polarization within the Christian communities because we cannot understand the Bible? Well, what we need, obviously, are some ground rules for the interpretation of the Bible. I think that's basic to everything else some ground rules that everybody can agree on, every Christian, for the interpretation of the Bible. Where are you going to find those ground rules? <clears throat> Technically, this is called hermeneutics. Where are you going to find your hermeneutics? Are you going to go to a philosopher today, to an ed educator today? Or are you going to go to one of the 16th century reformation? Are you going to go to a school in Dallas and ask them over there? Or are you going to go and ask uh, for people in biblical times where were their ground rules for interpretation? The best thing would be to find the, in the Bible itself a chapter entitled hermeneutics, interpretation, principles of interpretation, right? But there isn't any such thing in the Bible. So what do we do? confusion prevails. However, <clears throat> and I want this to be my contribution to this conference, I believe that there is help and that we do have access to some basic principles of interpretation that are drawn 
from the structure, if not the content, from the structure of the Bible itself. And during those three sessions, I'm going to propose to you three principles of interpretation, three ground rules that come from the Bible itself, you're going to see. The first one we'll call the thematic, thematic principle of interpretation. What do you recognize in thematic? What word? Yeah, theme, theme. Okay. Now, to understand what is meant by this, first, you tell me, what is the smallest unit of the Bible? The verse, and then what? Chapter, and then? The book, and so on. Okay, this is how we uh, are used to, uh, to viewing the Bible as a compendium of verses, a huge reservoir of verses. And when we want to know something, we find a verse here and we find another verse here on the same subject. We bring those verses together and what do we get? Monstrosities. <laughs> Because for any such monstrosity that you have created, I can go and find another set of verses and align them here and create another monster and they will devour each other. You see, our mistake, and it is a mistake which has been propagated by the devil, I'm sure. Our mistake is to think that the smallest unit in the Bible is the verse. It isn't. Jesus never knew about the verse. The Apostle Paul never knew about verses and chapters. John, another author in the Bible, never knew about verses. Matthew, uh, Luke, those people never knew about verses. When was <clears throat> the chapter, the Bible divided in chapters and verses? When do you think? 5th century, 80, 10th perhaps? <clears throat> the Bible was divided in chapters in the 13th century AD. By an Englishman, the Bishop of Canterbury. And then, that wasn't good enough, it was subdivided in verses on the ba basis of chapter division in the 15th century AD. That's not so long ago. by a Frenchman, French printer, by the name of Robert Etienne. That makes the verse division inspired, of course, because it was Frenchman. <laughs> but what was started as a convenient reference system to find our way through the text of the Bible has become part and parcel, an inspired framework for the Bible. So that today when we want to think in terms of the Bible, all we think of is verses. And what happens, what happens is a system of interpretation that I call scissors and paste. A collage, really a collage system of interpretation where we wrench from the text little bits and pieces here and we put them together to make the Bible say what it doesn't really say and what those texts separate within their own context don't say. See? We can make the Bible say anything that way. Just, just give me any stupid proposition. And give me time, give me a Bible and some scissors, and I'll wrench little verses here and there, and I'll bring them together, and I'll prove it to you, the Bible says so. It doesn't take much ingenuity. <clears throat> what we need to do is to recognize that the smallest unit of the Bible is not the verse, is not the chapter, but it is the book. The Bible comes to us in 66 distinct books. Each one of them with a specific authorship. 
And even though the same God inspired all those people and all those books, and therefore there is unity in the Bible, yet God respected their diversity. See? So that each book has its own worldview, its own character, its own vocabulary, its own grammatical mistakes sometimes, its own ways of saying things, its own theology. And that has to be recognized and respected. God doesn't violate us. And he doesn't want us to violate Jeremiah and Isaiah and Matthew and Romans and so on by taking little pieces and bring them together when they don't belong together. See? Let me show this to you. For instance, if I were to ask you to do a little study for tomorrow morning on the concept of faith, what would you do? Faith in the New Testament. How would you do that? What's the first book you would hit? A concordance. <laughs> A concordance. The tool of the devil. I'll tell you why. Suppose instead of hitting the concordance, what you do is go to the New Testament itself and discover that in the New Test the New Testament is made of individual books, each one with its own life, its own authorship, its own specificity, its own character. And you ask, for instance, you go to Matthew and you ask Matthew, Matthew, what does faith mean? Instead of taking a little verse here and bringing it with a little verse from, say, from the Gospel of John, and then digging out a little verse from Romans, and then wrenching a little text, say, from, from 1 or 2 Timothy or Titus, and then finding another verse in Hebrews, and then you go to James and find something else, and you bring all those things and create your little monstrosities here, okay? <laughs> Instead of doing that, you approach each book thematically. You go to Matthew and you say, hey, Matthew, what does faith mean? As God has inspired you to, to teach us about faith. And you do a thematic study, that is to say you do a word study, a topical study in Matthew, and you come to the conclusion that in Matthew, faith means something very distinct. As it does in Luke and Mark, by the way. It means, uh, simple trust, human trust in a benevolent, generous God who is anxious to meet human need. Childlike trust in God. That's what it means in Matthew. Now, you go to John and you do, instead of fooling around with little bits and verses of, you, you do a thematic study, you come up with the results of John and what is faith in John? Is it trust, like a baby, in a parent? Absolutely not. In John, faith is something entirely different. Same word, same word, friends, but different concept. Faith is relational, it's believing, and being accepted, and relating to. Faith is relational. <clears throat> you go to Romans. Instead of mutilating Romans by taking those little verses, you do a thematic study the way you should do. Okay? And you come up with the results in Romans. What is faith in Romans? Just Justifying faith. Nothing to do with trust here, nothing to do with, with relational. It's a forensic, it's a legal kind of transaction. See? Something entirely different. The same word, but different. Faith here becomes, becomes a transaction because you put your faith in God. It's, it's saving faith. You are justified by that, by that transaction. Same author, Romans, Timothy, Paul, same author, but different moments of, their, of his life, different books. And instead of taking that little verse, you do the thematic study here, you come with the summary of what 
the pastoral epistles, that's Timothy. What Timothy said, what Paul says in Timothy, what God through Paul says in Timothy about faith, and what you get, again, something entirely different. In, in the pastoral epistles, faith is right doctrine, orthodoxy, proper belief, properly defined. Same thing in Hebrews. You leave alone the low verses, but you do a thematic study of all the verses that relate to faith. Okay? And what you find in Hebrews, what is faith? In fact, there is a summary. One verse that summarizes faith is... Exactly, the substance and the conviction of things not seen, of things hoped for. Faith is up here. Up here, it's an understanding in the mind. It's an acquiescence to which you commit yourself in a kind of leap of faith. See, it's an entirely different concept. The same word. And then you go to James. And you do your thematic study and you come with a conclusion. And in James, what is faith? Action. Without works, there is no faith. It doesn't exist. In James, faith is action. The same word. And you see all the shades of meaning it has. You see what we do when we take verses and we bring them together and we make them say because we bring them together from different locations what they don't say in their own location and what the Bible doesn't say. We can make constructs that way that have nothing to do with the Bible except that they use wording from the Bible. So what I'm suggesting to you here is that you proceed thematically for every subject that you study and then you bring those results together, or as many as you have, even if you have one. At least you know what the Word of God is in that location. Or if you have two, that's fine. The emphasis here has been, Dr. Daisy, I so much appreciate that. Get personally involved in studying. There is no substitute. And this, you don't have to be a scholar to do this. You can easily take, say, the Gospel of Luke, and, and ask yourself, I'm going to study what the Gospel of Luke says about women. And go through it, men and women. See, at least you've got something, you've got something solid. You don't have verses picked up haphazardly. So when you do that on a topic, then you know what the Word of God is. You don't say, verse such and such says. Who cares what verse such and such says? <laughs> it's what God says through this author in that particular verse. See? A verse is always in a book. <laughs> Refer to the book. <laughs> because, because that's the totality. Okay, I see a couple of people who are writing notes. This is the way to put it. Uh, avoid cross-references. Avoid cross... Avoid? What do you mean avoid? Never cross-reference verses to verses across different books. You don't reference verses from book to book. Instead, what do you do? Let's put it positively now. Any verse or any part of the Bible, any verse or any part of the Bible must be interpreted within the meaning it has in the book where it is located. Okay? See, any part of the Bible, any verse here, that little verse I had which I erased in anger. Remember that one here? I committed violence on that verse. That verse has to be interpreted. How did I put it? Any verse of the Bible must be interpreted within the meaning it has within the book where it is located. Within the whole thing, not in isolation. Okay, let me show you how this relates to the issue we're studying right now for this conference, the whole thing. I'm going to do, to do a direct application of this principle in the equality, to the equality uh, subject, and in this case, <clears throat> to uh, the meaning of headship. Dr. Kruger already started uh, us thinking on this subject. I'd like to push it just a step further. And for that, I take you again to um, 1 Corinthians chapter 11.
And you remember, we have a problem with a little bit of interpretation here with verse 3. Verse 3, the Bill Gothard verse, where it says, I want you to understand, I want you to understand that the head of every man is Christ, the head of a woman is her husband, and the head of Christ is God. Okay, uh, what's the plain meaning? What's the plain meaning of, uh, of, this, uh, of, of this verse? Well, the plain meaning is like, like so. You see the step where I'm standing? At the top, there are four steps. Who is at the top? Who is at the top here? God. And then down here, second step down. Jesus. And then under Jesus, who's here? Third, man. And then way at the bottom down here. Looking up, women. That's right. Why? Because head means boss, authority. That's what it means in the English language. That's what it must mean in the Greek. <laughs> well, it's true that in some languages, and Latin is one of those languages, and, uh, and Spanish, and uh, today, and uh, English, in, uh, in Hebrew, ancient language, head mean, does mean or can mean authority. But there are some languages that do not, where head does not mean that. I happen to be a Frenchman. I felt very much at home when I came here and I saw that flag, the first one. <clears throat> Now, in the French language, head does not mean authority or boss. You cannot say in French, l'homme est la tête de sa femme. Nonsense. It means nothing. L'homme est la tête de sa femme. There is not one translation that has that in the French language. They cannot say it. You can say, uh, you can say a student is at the head of his class, but that doesn't mean no connotations of authority. It means l'étudiant est à la tête de sa classe, but that simply means that he, he, he's placed first, he's just positional. There is, he has no authority over the other students, okay? And there are some languages like that. And I claim that Greek is one of those languages where head does not mean authority. If it were, if it did mean that, look at what we would get. There would exist the same relation between Christ, between God and Christ, look at the heresy, as there exists between Christ and man. Christ who is equal with God, who is in the form of God through whom all things have been made, who is the origin of all things, and the terminator, the destination of all things, he would be, he would be in relation to man. Man would be in relation to Christ, the same way as Christ would be to God. I cannot think of a greater heresy that is now threatening to infiltrate the Christian church because of this attempt to show that there is a hierarchy within the divinity, therefore there must be a hierarchy among humans, male and female. Well, anyway, <clears throat> there are at least two problems with this view. Well, there are three. The one I mentioned, theological, which is considerable, but I'm not going to deal with that one. The other problem is that in this place, the Apostle Paul is not building a hierarchy. Look at the order, the sequence. If he were building a hierarchy, he would say, what would he say? What would be the first term? That's right, he would begin with God. He's the head of Christ. And then he would go down, Christ is the head of man. And then, man is the head of women, see? All the way down. He begins here the other way around. The Apostle Paul knows exactly how to build their hierarchy. Look at chapter 12, verse 28. I mean, he's not sloppy for things like this. 
God has appointed in the church first apostles, second prophets, third teachers, and then such and such. And there are other hierarchies like this that the Apostle Paul builds. And in a matter much more important than the spiritual gifts, in a matter that has to do with the stratification, supposedly, of, uh, of all beings created in, God, in the image of God, he would be more careful than this. <clears throat> they would have it like this. God, who is the boss of Christ, who's the boss of uh, men, who's the boss of women. Who's down here? The kids. <laughs> and then the family dog. <clears throat> now, instead, this is the way Paul has it. The head of every man is Christ. Man, Christ. Then, the second clause. The head of a woman is her husband. Woman, man. Husband or man, same thing. And then, the head of Christ is God. See, what should be number one here is last. What should be number two here, in between, you see here, is first. What should be number three here is number two. The thing is all jumbled up. That's not like Paul. He's a very systematic thinker. Another problem <clears throat> is that the meaning of authority for this verse is not confirmed in the context. Kathy's been dealing with the context, immediate context, the thing about the veil and the hair and so on, and there is no confirmation of this idea of headship as authority in this passage. However, the word head is used once more in the epistle, and that's what you have to do, you have to deal thematically with this thing. It's, it's, uh, it's, it's there once more. It's in chapter 12. Where Paul talks about the body. Look at the chapter 12 verses 14 to 16. 14 to 25, the whole passage. You see where he mentions head, verse 21. The eye cannot say to the hand, I have no need of you, nor again the head to the feet, I have no need of you. And then he goes on. He uses the head here in a figurative sense. Head is just like one of the members of the church. There are several things you can say from this passage about the use of head. The first one is that the head in this passage has no privileged status. No privileged position. It is treated as one of the components of the body. It is listed without any mark of distinction. In fact, the passage begins with the mention of feet. Verse 13, verse 15, the foot cannot say to the hand, second the hand. And the eye, and then the ear. The sense of smell, and last of all, there is a mention of head in verse 21. The head, in this figurative imagery here, is not superior to the other members of the body. Second thing you can say here is that the head has no privileged role in this passage. <clears throat> Look at verse 21. The head cannot say to the feet, I have no need of you. Cannot claim autonomy, cannot claim independence, which is one of the marks, self, 
self-assertion of the marks of being the boss, cannot claim self-determination, cannot dismiss another member as a boss would. In fact, here it says that the head is interdependent on the other members of the body, even the, the, the most inferior parts of the body, in this case, the feet. The head in this passage has no authority over the other members. It is part of the body, just to the same extent as the others, the other members. But more than that, look at verse 23. In those parts of the body which we think less honorable. Now, we make stratifications. We make differentiations. We say, you know, we say uh, superior, inferior. But look at what God does in verse 24. But God. We think so, but God has so adjusted the body, giving the greater honor to the inferior part. God reverses the whole thing. He reverses the chain of command, takes it like this and puts it upside down. And he says, the first shall be last. Those who want to be on top will start from the bottom. Because the Christian community is a downscale community where downward mobility prevails. That's what the meaning of servanthood is. There are two results to this reversal that God operates. Look at verse 25. So that there will be no divisions in the body. Verse 25, you see it? There will be no distinctions. The word is schisma. There will be no discriminations such as ruler, subject, boss, and uh, inferior. And then the second, but that the members of the body may have an equal concern for one another. Those are not my words, they're the Apostle Paul. Equal consideration for each other in the context of headship here. So, if head doesn't mean authority in Corinthian, what does it mean? What does it mean? Sorry, I deal with uh, Corinthians thematically and Corinthians doesn't tell me anymore about the meaning of head. That's all it tells me. I'm left in the dark. But fortunately, Corinthians is not the only book which treats with that subject. Like faith, there are different books that treat with the subject, that treat the subject, and, and there are other books in the New Testament that treat the subject of head used figuratively. There are essentially two of them. One of them is Ephesians, the other one is Colossians. Let's look at Ephesians. You thought you were going to come here and I would let you sit down and take a nap. I won't. You're going to work. <clears throat> look at uh, Ephesians chapter 1, verses 22 and 23. I'll give you the main references here. God has put, he's talking about Christ, all things under his feet and gave him head above all things, gave him head to the church, which is his body, the fullness of him who fills all in all. Now, here, very distinctly, it talks about the relationship of Christ as head to the church. And what is, pray tell me, what is the function of the head in relation to the church as described in verse 23? Look at it and tell me. What does the head do in relation to the body? That's right, give it fullness supplies the head. The head is the supplier, the provider of fullness. It is the source of the fullness of the growth of the, uh, of the growth of the finality of the church. It makes the church what the church should be as the ultimate community. Another instance is in chapter 4 verse 15 where head used figuratively happens again. 
<coughs> you see that? Verse 15. Christ is the head. The head of the church. In which we are to grow. And from which, verse, verse 16, from which the whole body joined and knit together by every joint with which it is supplied, when each part is working properly, makes bodily growth and upbuilds itself in love. Now, he is again here an authority role described for Jesus as head in relation to the church, is it? Is there any hint of Christ's lordship being mentioned here in relation to head? What is mentioned? Again, the role of supplier, the source of life, source of growth, source of cohesion. Chapter 5, verse 23. Great text. You hear it at every wedding. And then they ask the wives to become slaves to their husbands by obeying them. A word which in the New Testament never uses as a command for wives to obey their husbands. Never! It's not in the New Testament. In the New Testament it's mutual submission. Look at verse 23. The husband is the head of the wife as Christ is the head of the church, his body, and he is himself. It's what? It's Lord? It's boss? It's Savior, servant role, supplying life and salvation. Each one of those instances indicates, taken thematically within that one book, that the word head is used as source of something, supplier of something, originator of something. Look at Colossians. Chapter 1, verse 18. In the middle of a great Christological passage, a great, a great passage on the doctrine of Christ. <clears throat> verse 18. He is the head of the body, the church. What does that mean? Well, you have to tell by what he does as head. Verse 17. He is before all things, and in him all things hold together. Verse 18, he is the head of body, the church, he is the beginning. The firstborn from the, king, from, the, from the dead, that in all things he may be preeminent. For in him all the fullness of God was pleased to dwell and to reconcile. What, what is the role again that is attached to headship? He's the beginning. He's the source of all things. In him all things hold. He's the one who, who pumps energy into the totality of reality to hold it together. And he doesn't even say because of that he's Lord. He says he's preeminent as supplier. You see, again, there is a, almost a designed avoidance of the use of the concept of authority in connection with the, with, with the term head. Colossians chapter 2, verse 10. In him you have come to the fullness of life who is the head of all rule and authority. What does he do in relation to church, to the church here? What does he give? Fullness of life again. And he is the head of all rule and authority. He is the originator of all rule of an authority. He's the source of their life. Not only he has given life to the church, but he's given life to everything that there is, even at the highest levels, as head. In chapter 2, verse 19, can it be any clearer than this? Look at verse 18 and 19, oh, verse 19, I'm sorry. Holding fast to the head, from whom the whole body nourished and knit together through its joints and ligaments grows with a growth that is from God. 
talking about the church here holding fast to the head and what does the head do in relation to the church in this passage again supplier nur nurturer source of life growth cohesion that's it. I don't have any more references on head. But you see, we have treated thematically here. We have treated Corinthians, where the meaning of head is certainly not authority, but it's not very clear as to what it is. But then we move on to those two epistles, Ephesians and Colossians, and it becomes very clear the head is, <clears throat> is a servant role. Servant role. Instead of being the boss, the Lord, as we often take it, it's the opposite. Servant, supplier, source, provider. You see what, you see, you see, we make, we make the New Testament say the opposite of what it says by using little verses. See why I get so mad? Now, this going back to 1 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 3, fits beautifully. Beautifully. Now it makes sense. Because this don't make sense. It doesn't make sense. Theologically, it doesn't make sense. Textually, it's not the way, the way Paul says it. This is false. It's false teaching. It's heresy. Now, when head is understood as source, source of life, now this makes sense. In the epistle to the Corinthians, we are told that in Christ and through him, how does he say it? Jesus Christ, through whom all things exist and through whom we exist. He is the creator. And the first, the first being that he created in his image was man. Okay. In that sense, Christ is the head of man. The source of his life. Then, where does woman come from in the Genesis story? Comes from man. Man is the source of woman's life. In fact, the Apostle Paul, chapter 11, he says that. He says, verse 8, man was not made from woman, but woman from man. Okay. And then Christ, and he's referring here to, to the Christ of the incarnation, to the Christmas story, who is the father of Christ. I'm so, yeah, who is the father of Christ? God. God is the head, the source of his life. Now it makes sense to say, the, the, the designation of head understood in this matter gives sense to the order of the sequence of those three categories. Okay, to conclude on this, <clears throat> and this afternoon I'll, I'll come up with the second principle. But uh, in order to conclude together on this, I want us to do a little exercise. Let's go back to Ephesians chapter 5. And we're going to read that great passage on servanthood, <clears throat> on mutual subjection. Verses 21 to, to, to 33, okay? But look here. From time to time, I'm going to pause, and I'm going to go like this. And then it will be your turn. And all of you in unison, at that point, you say, servant role. Let's practice it. Servant role. Okay, why? Because what, what Paul will have just talked to us about designates a servant role. And you're going to have to see the beautiful meaning of mutual servanthood that the passage has, which is so often corrupted in a hierarchical chain of authority. Let's do it. Be subject to one another. Out of reverence for Christ. Wives, to your husbands, be subject to your husbands. As to the Lord. 
for the husband is the head of the wife. As Christ is the head of the body, the church, and he's himself its savior. As the church is subject to Christ, so let wives also be subject in everything to their husbands. That's right. Husbands, love your wives. Better believe it. As th th there is no definition of love, no better definition of love in the New Testament than servantness. And there is no better definition in the New Testament of submission as servantness. They both come to the same thing. So, husband, love your wives as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her that he might sanctify her having cleansed her by the washing of water with the word that the church might be presented before him in splendor without spot or wrinkle or any such thing that she might be holy and without blemish even so husbands should love their wives as their own bodies he who loves his wife loves himself for no man ever hates his own flesh, but nourishes it, cherishes it, as Christ does the church, because we are members of his body. Isn't that something? Now, you take this beautiful passage and you superimpose some, some scheme of authority in it, on it, and you have destroyed it. See you this afternoon. <clears throat> Welcome back. Now, do you see the reason to study the Bible? There are many who seem to teach the truth of the Bible, but how do you know that they teach the truth? Jesus said to be careful to whom we listen to. In Matthew 24, 11, it says, and many false prophets shall arise and shall deceive many. And in 24, it says, for there shall rise false Christs and false prophets who shall show great signs and wonders, insomuch that if it were possible, they shall deceive the very elect. There is only one way, and that is to study it for yourself. As Gilbert Bilizekian said, you do not have to have a special education or be a theologian to understand the Bible. Listen to what the Apostle Paul says to us in 1 Corinthians 1, 26 through 30. I'll read that. Consider your own call, brothers and sisters. Not many of you were wise by human standards. Not many were powerful. Not many were of noble birth. But God shows what is foolish in the world to shame the wise. God shows what is weak in the world to shame the strong. God shows what is low and despised in the world, things that are not, to reduce to nothing things that are, so that no one might boast in the presence of God. He is the source of your life in Christ Jesus, who became for us wisdom from God, and righteousness and sanctification and redemption. The Apostle Paul said we should not trust in human wisdom, but in the power that comes from the Holy Spirit. Then we also can produce godly wisdom. Look what Paul said in 1 Corinthians 2, 4 through 10. And he, Paul said, And my speech and my preaching were not with persuasive words of human wisdom, but in a demonstration of the Spirit and of power, that your faith, faith should not be in the wisdom of men, but in the power of God. However, we speak wisdom among those who are mature, yet not the wisdom of this age, nor of the rulers of this age, who are coming to nothing. But we speak the wisdom of God in a mystery, the hidden wisdom which God ordained before the ages of, for our glory, which none of the rulers of this age knew, for had they known, they would not have crucified the Lord of glory. But as it is written, eye has not seen, nor ear heard, nor have entered into the heart of man the things which God has prepared for those who love him. But God has revealed them unto us through his Spirit, the Holy Spirit, for the Spirit searches all things, yes, the deep things of God. The best way to learn God's truth is to have a humble, repentant heart by submitting to God and having our wicked hearts changed to the way of God. In Acts 2.38 it says, Then Peter said unto them, Repent and be baptized, every one of you, 
in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins, and you shall receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. Uh, James, in James 4, 6 through 10, it says, Submit yourselves, therefore, to God. Resist the devil, and he will flee from you. Draw near to God, and he will draw near to you. Cleanse your hands, you sinners, and purify your hearts, you double-minded. Be afflicted, and mourn, and weep. Let your laughter be turned to mourning, and your joy to heaviness. Humble yourself in the sight of the Lord, and he shall lift you up. We all need to study the Bible more so we can work out our own salvation. We'll all give account of ourselves to God for what we do with our lives. Look, Paul, look what Paul said in Romans 14, 7 through 12. Here he said, For none of us lives to himself, and no one dies to himself. For if we live, we live to the Lord, and if we die, we die to the Lord. Therefore, whether we live or die, we are the Lord's. For to this end Christ died and rose and again and lived again, that he might be Lord of both the dead and the living. But why do you judge your brother? Or why do you show contempt for your brother? For we shall all stand before the judgment seat of Christ. For it is written, As I live, says the Lord, every knee shall bow to me, and every tongue shall confess to God. So then each of us, both men and women, shall give account of themselves to God. Remember to have um, a repentant, humble heart, and with the help of the Holy Spirit, we can learn the truth from the Bible and become the children of God. Romans 8, um, 14 says, those who are led by the Spirit of God are the children of God. And Romans 16 says, for you did not receive a spirit that makes you a slave again to fear, but you received the spirit of adoption. And by the spirit we cry, Abba, Father, uh, means Dad also. The Holy Spirit testifies with our spirit that we are God's children. So, so long, long for, for now. now.